Good evening, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to the final program in our eight-part Great Decisions series with topics suggested by the Foreign Policy Association. I'm Michael Vendenen. I'm the Executive Director of the World Affairs Council. And on behalf of the Council, uh, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. World Affairs Council empowers the people and organizations of West Michigan to engage thoughtfully with the world, and we do that with many partners, our, all of our colleges and universities in the area, and many, many businesses. We uh, specifically thank Roman Manufacturing this evening and Spectrum Health for being our corporate sponsors for tonight's program. And we also are very glad to partner with the Grand Rapids Dominican Sisters. Um, you'll hear in a minute why there's a special connection with them, and uh, it's been a delight to work with them on this program. I also want to uh, welcome our collaborators from Montcalm Community College who are here, Dr. Gary Hawk, the Dean of Arts and Sciences. There's Gary. And uh, Gary has been a key contributor to the Great Decision Series, helping us plan these every year. If you're retiring this year, we're gonna miss you, Gary. Thank you so much for your work. Yeah, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. And uh, he's sitting by uh, Montcalm Community College's Dean of Nursing, Danielle Anderson. So thank you, Danielle, for being with us. And uh, she is another campus leader who will be helping us in the future. That's great. After Ambassador Peter's, Peter's presentation this evening, there will be ample time for questions. And you can use the response cards that you were given when you came in. Or there will be a uh, phone number text. You can text your questions in. We think that's been working quite well. I've been getting good feedback from a number of you about that system. And we will do that again tonight. Dr. Erica Kubik, our Director of Programming, will do the Q&A with Ambassador Peters. And now, Sister Lucian Sears, who is a member of the Grand Rapids Dominicans, will introduce our speaker, Sister. Good evening. As Grand Rapids Dominicans, we as a congregation of vowed women religious and committed associates who preach the word of God to a world that hungers for deeper truth and meaning. The pillars of our Dominican life are prayer, study, community, and service. We are the founders of Aquinas College and the former Marywood Academy, where our speaker, Ambassador Peters, spent part of her elementary and high school years. We are pleased and proud to have her with us today in Grand Rapids. It is my privilege to introduce you to Sister, or to Sister Mary Ann, right? Sorry about my that. Life, Sister. <laughs> Ambassador Mary Ann Peters. Um, she joined the Carter Center in 2014. The Carter Center is a nonprofit organization based in Atlanta, Georgia, and guided, similar to our commitments, the fundamental commitment to human rights and to the alleviation of human suffering. It seeks to prevent and resolve conflicts, enhance freedom and democracy, and improve health. As CEO, Ambassador Peters provides vision and leadership for the Carter Center and oversees programs, implementation, and their operations. Before coming to the Carter Center, Ambassador Peters spent more than 30 years as a career diplomat. She served as ambassador to Bangladesh, was the deputy, deputy chief of mission in Ottawa, Canada, and she served as director for European and Canadian affairs on the National Security Council staff, where she worked on Northern Ireland peace process. As that career diplomat continued in her early work as a diplomat included Sofia, Bulgaria, Moscow during the Soviet era, Rangoon and Mandalay in Burma, and Frankfurt, Germany. She was also provost of the U.S. Naval War College from September 2008 to July 2014. And prior to that, she was dean of academics at the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies in Germany. You can imagine that she's been very busy in her life. Uh, Ambassador Peters is a graduate of Santa Clara University and holds an MA from Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. She also, in her current job, is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and Women in International Security and serves on the boards of the Task Force for Global Health and the Emory Global Health Institute. 
So you can imagine that she might be very tired, but she's absolutely filled with energy. <laughs> with all of her experience, she does work at the Carter Center with enthusiasm and compassion and grace. Her presentation today is titled Global Health, Equity, Ethics, and Eradication. Please welcome Ambassador Mary Ann Peters to Western Michigan. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Lisa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sister Lucianne, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, of course, it's a pleasure to be here at Aquinas College this evening. Uh, I'm delighted to be a guest of the World Affairs Council, and of course, I'm delighted to be back in Grand Rapids, where, as you just heard from Sister Lucianne, I graduated from high school at Marywood Academy. I bring greetings from the uh, president of our own World Affairs Council in Atlanta, Ambassador retired Charles Shapiro, whom some of you may know. As uh, Sister Lucianne said, my topic this evening is global health, equity, ethics, and eradication. But first, I need to make a disclaimer. I am speaking on this topic as the CEO of the Carter Center, but uh, I am not an epidemiologist or a physician. The Carter Center is deeply engaged in global health activities, as are many of my colleagues. And I'm fortunate that my own views on global health and global health equity have been shaped by those colleagues who do have deep scientific knowledge and expertise, and many of whom are uh, physicians and epidemiologists. Now, I'm going to dive right into the ethics issue. Excuse me by quoting one of the most revered figures in the global health field, Dr. Paul Farmer, chairman of Harvard Medical School's Department of Global Health and Social Medicine, and the founder of an organization called Partners in Health, which is particularly well known for its work in Haiti. Farmer says, the idea that some lives matter less is the root of all that is wrong with the world. That's the most succinct version I've ever heard of the ethical imperative for efforts to improve global health. Farmer and the wonderful global health zealots with whom I am privileged to work at the Carter Center believe that no one should have to suffer or die from a preventable or curable condition. And the founders of the Carter Center former President Jimmy Carter and Mrs. Rosalind Carter, share Dr. Farmer's view. President Carter often says that access to basic health care is a basic human right, and human rights are universal. Now, let's, let's delve into this for a moment by using life expectancy as a rough measure of global health inequality. And there's great news on this front. A child born in 1900, just over 100 years ago, on a global basis had a life expectancy of only 30 years. Today, according to the World Bank, the comparable figure is 71 years. But of course, that number hides huge disparities. In Chad, uh, in the Sahel region of Africa, life expectancy is less than 50 years, while in Japan, it's almost 84 years. In the US, our life expectancy is now 78.8 years, which puts us at number 31 in the world, just behind Costa Rica and ahead of Cuba. By the way, as I'm sure you realize, all these numbers include both male and female life expectancy. And just about everywhere, it's true that women tend to live a few years longer uh, than men. Now, globally, the inequality in life expectancy is shrinking, although there's still a long way to go. But that's just one indicator of the inequity uh, that we're, we're facing. Here are a couple more examples. Children in the developing world are far more likely to die before they reach the age of five than children here or in other rich countries. And their mothers are far more likely to die in childbirth or from complications of childbirth than are women here. Now, the leading causes of death in these children under five are things like malaria, pneumonia, and diarrhea, which are all treatable for us and for our children. Among people of all ages, 99% of all deaths from AIDS 
tuberculosis and malaria occur in developing countries. And again, those conditions are treatable for us when they do occur. So trying to close the global health gap is such a big challenge that those of us who work in global health have to pick our battles. And at the Carter Center, we work primar primarily on a particular challenge, neglected tropical diseases, which are, as the name suggests, diseases that until recently didn't get much attention or draw many resources. But these diseases, and there are about 20 of them, collectively afflict more than 1 billion people in 149 countries and cost untold suffering as well as billions of dollars every year in lost productivity. And these NTDs, as we call them, afflict the poorest of the poor. As one of my colleagues likes to say, they are neglected diseases of people who themselves are neglected. So rather than describe what NTDs are and the impact they have, I'm going to show you a short video about the Carter Center's campaign to eradicate one of these NTDs called guinea worm disease. First video, please. Guinea worm is a nasty parasite. It is something you get from drinking contaminated water. When you swallow the water, the guinea worm will then live inside of your body for about a year. Once there is a blister on the skin and that ruptures, the worm will emerge. It's very painful. If the patient enters water, the worm will then release fluid. And inside that fluid are thousands of guinea worm larvae. Once they are in the water, they are eaten by a water flea or a cyclops. It is then the cyclops that you drink and then the cycle begins again. The problem is that this is still a very dry area and they get water when they can out of a deep well, a borehole. But when those uh, water supplies dry up, the people go to the ancient ponds and they dip up the water and drink it and it has within it guinea worm eggs and then a year later they have guinea worms coming out of their bodies. If the worm comes out at a joint, say in your knee, the, it swells up and destroys the tissue. So the aftermath is very similar to polio. It completely debilitates that knee and, and sometimes the leg is, is crippled for the rest of one's life. And of course these kids can't go to school. The, the pain is too great and they need uh, medical care. And if it's an adult, they can't go into the field to plant the crops. just tragic to see all these children walking around still with guinea worm in this day and age when it can be prevented. In every country where guinea worm is endemic, it is the Ministry of Health and the National Guinea Worm Eradication Program that's the driving process. The role of the Carter Center is to assist those programs technically and financially so that the job can get done. The Carter Center is a, an indispensable uh, partner. Southern Sudan is the most difficult place to work. It is a very vast country. There is a dearth of infrastructure. And we have to work during the peak of the rainy season, which is when the guinea worm transmission occurs. You use this as a tool to educate people about uh, the fact that guinea worm is in their water and when they don't filter the water, they ingest these animals and, uh, and that's how they get infected. They see for the first time where guinea worm is and, and where it comes from. Guinea worm is an indicator of the level of poverty or where there is poverty. And we use guinea worm as an entry point when we're trying to address poverty and development issues. And this area reported more guinea worm than any other area in all of eastern Equatoria. So we're trying to hit it as hard as possible. When the guinea worm emerges, we have to catch it within 24 hours. We have to bandage it within 24 hours. And that can't happen without village volunteers. It's, it's a huge challenge. But we can help people prevent it by teaching them 
not to contaminate the water when they have these worms coming out of their body by helping them to uh, learn how to filter their water through a finely woven cloth, their drinking water, and by putting a chemical in the water to kill the parasite in the water, or by helping them to get uh, safe drinking water from underground wells. This has made a huge difference in this community. They used to have to walk in the dry season to pools they had to dig. So now they have fresh, clean water all the time, which is now they're free of guinea worm. The 20 countries that were originally endemic at the beginning of the campaign in 1986, most have eradicated the disease. Only Sudan, Ghana, and Mali remain endemic. Well, Tagoli is one of the villages in the heavily endemic guinea worm area that has completely eradicated guinea worm by taking the advice that we have brought to them and the help that the Carter Center and many others have provided. And uh, this proves that it's completely possible to eliminate guinea worm completely. And when you don't have guinea worm, uh, then the children can go to school, the farmers can plant their crops, and the entire economic status of a village and a community and a nation can be helped. Thank you. As you can imagine, the guinea worm's year-long cycle makes it difficult to detect and challenging to treat and prevent. This has been called the disease of empty granaries because, as you heard, its crippling effects can keep people from planting, cultivating, or harvesting the crops that uh, they and their families depend on. And to further complicate the task, as you saw, like all NTDs, this is a disease of the poor and dispossessed, people living beyond the end of the road, with little or no access to any kind of healthcare infrastructure. And frankly, because it's a disease of the very poor, it has not always been high on the agendas of political leaders. So I chose the guinea worm um, program as one to highlight today for three reasons. One is that it really does illustrate very clearly the global health gap, because this is a disease of abject poverty, a horrifying, painful, debilitating disease that none of us here today will ever get, nor will anyone we know or love. The second reason is that fighting guinea worm disease is a quintessential Carter Center program, a difficult problem, one no one else was particularly eager to tackle, a disease, as I said, of the people at the end of the road, and an assault on human dignity. Now, when the Carter Center started the battle against this disease, there were 3.5 million cases in 21 countries. Thanks to our team of guinea worm warriors, the vast majority of whom are community-level volunteers, the number of human cases in 2017 was only 30 in just two countries. Now, we do have an outbreak among animals, particularly dogs, that must be dealt with before we can finish the eradication campaign. And again, as you heard, what's especially inspiring about the progress against this disease is that there is no cure, no vaccine or therapeutic drug for guinea worm. People who get it don't even have the luxury of becoming immune, but can suffer multiple worms year after year. In the absence of universal access to clean water, and we are a very long way from that, the way you have to eradicate guinea worm is to educate people to change their behavior. First, as you saw, they must filter their water um, using a cloth at home or a pipe with a filter at the end when they travel. And the other way, people need to modify their behavior to interrupt transmission of guinea worm disease is to stay out of the village water source while the worm is emerging. But since emerging the affected area, which is usually a limb, often a foot or a leg, uh, actually helps to alleviate the pain, the sufferers are making a conscious decision to stay out of the water for the good of their communities. But the third reason I wanted to illustrate um, the guinea worm program is because it is an effort to eradicate a disease from the face of the earth. And we at the Carter Center believe that when it's possible, eradication is the best choice, better for our common human humanity and better for common sense. Only one human disease has been eradicated from the globe, and that, of course, was smallpox in 1979. Now there are two diseases that are actually quite close to eradication, 
guinea worm disease, and polio. And of course, you've heard about guinea worm. The eradication campaign against polio is also nearing the finish line. Last year, there were just 22 cases in three countries. But since those countries are Nigeria, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, the polio campaign also has its work cut out for it. Now, a couple of years ago, President Carter gave a speech on disease eradication at the House of Lords in London. And what he said is that disease eradication is a better choice than simple disease control, better not only economically and from a global health perspective, but a better ethical choice. Because if we choose merely to control a disease like guinea worm, for instance, we're saying, we're choosing that some people, other people, will continue to suffer from that disease. Not only that, but over the long term, eradication is obviously cheaper. Spending nothing forever, which is what you do after you've eradicated a disease, is clearly cheaper than whatever you may spend for a certain number of years um, for control programs. In fact, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, has determined that the US, quote, saves the total of all of its contributions to smallpox eradication ever efforts every 26 days because it no longer has to vaccinate or treat the disease. In other words, the savings from the eradication of smallpox are enormous, and the same will be true of guinea worm disease and polio. And the third advantage, after the ethical advantage and the financial advantage, the third advantage of taking an eradication approach is that it ensures that a disease we all thought was under control won't come roaring back, possibly to harm us, as well as those in villages in other places. A colleague of mine says that eradication is in our human DNA because the desire to accomplish a lofty, seemingly impossible goal is fundamental to human beings. And eradication responds to our desire for closure, to get it done and move on. Um, some years ago, the Carter Center established an organization called the International Task Force on Disease Eradication. And this is the only international body that characterizes diseases by scientific criteria to determine whether they are technically eradicable. The task force has actually listed seven diseases that are deemed eradicable. Uh, and only two, guinea worm and polio, are actually close to eradication. Um, there are actually some other diseases that the task force hasn't yet put on the list because although they may be scientifically eradicable, um, there's a lack of political will or resources. By the way, the other eradical, eradicable diseases that are on the task force list, in addition to guinea worm and polio, are measles, mumps, rubella, which I knew is German measles, pork ta tapeworm, and a disease called lymphatic filariasis, which is more commonly known as elephantiasis. And I'd like to show you a second video clip about this last disease. Lymphatic filariasis, or LF, has been eliminated as a public health problem in two states in Nigeria, thanks to a collaborative effort led by Nigeria's Federal Ministry of Health and the Carter Center. The mosquitoes, they are not infected anymore, and younger children are not showing evidence that they have it. We believe that if you extrapolate this results from Plateau and Nasara to the whole country, that it will be possible to eliminate LF in Nigeria. More than 120 million people are at risk of contracting LF in Nigeria, Africa's most endemic country and the second most endemic in the world. This is a, a grotesque disfiguration, causes great suffering, um, and is one of the major causes of disability actually in the world. Often seen as elephantiasis, LF is a parasitic disease spread by mosquitoes. The mosquitoes take the infection from one person and transmit it to the next. But you would treat her yeah. based on her age. The seeds of elimination in Nigeria were planted in 1999 when the Carter Center developed a multi-pronged strategy to prevent LF. Community chosen health workers mobilized to educate their neighbors about the disease and distribute donated oral medications, albendazole and mectazan, once a year. These two drugs combine to kill the parasite that causes the infection. 
insecticide-treated bed nets provide additional protection against mosquito bites, and this one-two punch has delivered the fatal blow to LF in the states of Plateau and Nasarawa. Now the Carter Center and partners have taken this success into the next round as they battle LF in other parts of the country Good morning. to ensure Nigeria's children will refer to this disease as one of the past. Thank you very much. Sit down. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Now, uh, unlike guinea worm disease, which um, is now confined to a, a, a few areas in just two countries, an estimated 856 million people in 52 countries worldwide, worldwide remain threatened by LF and need preventive therapy to stop the spread of this terrible parasitic infection. About 120 million people are already infected, with about 40 million disfigure, disfigured and incapacitated by the disease. The terrible swelling of the limbs that you just saw in the video cannot, sadly, be reversed. Once the limbs have reached this point, the only treatment is care of the limb to keep it from getting worse and help the sufferer lead a more normal life. So of course our preference is to eliminate LF wherever we can before it reaches the advanced stage. And this is done through something you also saw in the video, Mass Drug, Administra Mass Drug Administration, or MDA. And we assist uh, local volunteers and ministries of health to distribute these donated drugs that stop mosquitoes from transmitting the parasite from infected to uninfected people. And here, I want to put in a word about the incredible generosity of the pharmaceutical companies, in this case Merck, GlaxoSmithKline, and SA, which donate the drugs to combat LF. Their generosity is an example, I think, for other private sector actors when they want to think about how to get involved in improving and changing the world. In Nigeria in 2016, I visited a Hope Club, which is a club for sufferers from LF, where they can gather and learn to take care of their affected limbs with a combination of medicines that can cost as little as 50 cents a year per person. Now, from talking with those victims and the people who run the Hope Club, I learned something you can't realize from watching the video or hearing about LF, and that is that untreated, the affected limbs give off a very unpleasant odor, so bad that many sufferers are isolated from their families. They're forced to live elsewhere. So perhaps just as important as the treatment of the physical effects of LF is the treatment of the emotional effects of the disease. Those with severe symptoms are often unable to work because of the physical disability brought on by the disease. Clearly, many suffer from social stigma and shunning as a result of their disfigurement. And that brings me to another aspect of global health inequity, and that is the lack of access, the almost complete and total lack of access to mental health services in most of the developing world. And these countries, the countries where there are no mental health services, are often the countries where people have been subjected to extraordinary stress and trauma, not just from disease, but often from conflict as well. Now, in Liberia, a country where a brutal civil war took place in two phases between 1989 and 2003, and where the Ebola virus struck in 2014, the Carter Center has started a program to expand access to mental health. We work with key partners at the government and community levels to build sustainable mental health care infrastructure in post-conflict Liberia. And my third and final clip this evening is about that work. Congratulations! Today is the graduation of the child and adolescent mental health clinicians. After six months of intensive mental health training developed by the Carter Center and Partners in collaboration with the government of Liberia, Musalem Masakwe, Theophilus Joe, and 19 classmates nurses, physician's assistants, and a midwife. 
head back to their communities to focus on building a healthy future for Liberia's young people. Looking forward to see how children's lives are improved. Looking forward that our country will identify some of those challenges that children face, especially stigma, discrimination. Of my patients. Now that I can detect early childhood mental health disorder, it is not going to ascend to adulthood. These new graduates join 21 child and adolescent clinicians already working in hospitals, clinics, and schools to provide mental health support to young people living in a country struggling to overcome the lingering effects of a decades-long civil war, devastating Ebola outbreak, and previous lack of mental health services. They come with learning disability, have some emotional problems, anxiety, depression. Just take a deep breath. Yama Tukpa is a nurse in a school-based clinic. She went through the Carter Center training in 2016. Decided to organize a health club for them, do a group section of those that had problems, an individual section. 17-year-old Stephen Flomo is president of the student health group. I learned how to comfort someone, to talk to someone. They only talk about anger management, to not drink, and we also talk about drug abuse. I think it will be good for all to have this program that people will learn from it. Liberia's challenge is the challenge mental health workers face around the world, creating awareness about the causes and treatments for mental illnesses and combating the stigma and misconceptions surrounding these diseases. Musalim Masakwe and her fellow clinicians intend to make Liberia a model for global mental health care and give the people of Liberia hope. Yeah. So at least they can get the idea that mental health can be treated in areas that they can go for treatment. They have hope again. You may know, uh, Mrs. Rosalind Carter has had just one cause during her time in public life and that is to improve access to mental health care and reduce the stigma that so often accompanies mental illness. Now, when the Carter Center started this program, the mental health program in post-conflict Liberia in 2010, there was one mental health worker, a psychiatrist for nearly four million people, people who had suffered, as I said, a particularly brutal and lengthy civil war. It's fair to say that while there are a number of organizations that seek to build peace in post-conflict countries, very few focus on the need for mental health interventions among people who have suffered from sustained and brutal violence. The Carter Center has now trained 230 mental health workers for the healthcare delivery systems across the country almost all of whom <clears throat> worked as part of the Ebola response, and one, serving as a nurse, died of the disease. Now, 230 people for a population of 4 million doesn't seem like all that many, but of course, it's so much more, so many more, than um, what was there before. And now there are at least clinicians in every state of Liberia, they call them counties, in all 15 counties in uh, in Liberia. Um, and as you heard, we've now been asked to provide training specifically for mental health workers to help Liberians deal with the grief, depression, and trauma left behind by the Ebola outbreak. And we're focusing, excuse me, on training clinicians to work with children and adolescents. <coughs> Neglected tropical diseases and the complete neglect of mental health needs sharply illustrate global health inequity. And fighting those problems is one way to help people build better lives and to address the need, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> for greater equity. There is now, <coughs> I'm so sorry. <coughs> May I take just a minute? <coughs> there is now an increasing focus on the burden 
of chronic diseases. <coughs> I'm sorry. Oh, thank you so much. I'm sure this will help. I hope so. I apologize. <coughs> it is in here somewhere. Sorry. There you no go. problem. Oh, thank you, sister. Okay, better already. So there's now an increasing focus on chronic diseases in developing countries, which are the diseases we typically suffer from, including heart disease. And these now affect a growing number of people in the developing world. And there are, of course, other infectious diseases that are not neglected, notably malaria, tuberculosis, and HIV AIDS, all supported by major international and US donors. And all these efforts are important when we're talking about equity and ethical choices in global health. But if we need another reason beyond equity to focus on global health, it is that better health can unlock global development and increase stability around the world. <coughs> better health follows higher incomes <clears throat> but better health also drives economic development. You heard President Carter say how important it is that kids can go back to school and farmers can go back to their fields. As you can imagine, better health enables people to work longer and more productively, and not only keeps kids in school, but allows them to learn better. And when children are more likely to survive into adulthood, people tend to have smaller families with more income per person. So I'd like to end where we started with a quote that mirrors Dr. Farmer's quote. And this one is from the website of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which frankly has created unprecedented uh, momentum in the global health field. The website says, all lives have equal value. And then goes on to say, we are impatient optimists working to reduce inequity. We may not all have the Gates financial resources, but we can all be impatient optimists about global health. It's the right thing to do, and it will improve the world we all live in. Thank you. All right, let's uh, give Ambassador Peters one more round of applause. Thank you for this. And I, I did almost call you Ambassador Carter again, so I, I'm going to say... As I said the last time you did it, Marianne yeah. will do, and you won't so, make that mistake. No. Nope. All right. So, Marianne, it is. Thanks so much. Uh, please do text in your questions to me, or um, Michael will be handing or uh, picking up question cards, too. I've already gotten uh, a few text questions sure. already. Um, the first uh, is, and you addressed this a little bit, um, thinking about how... Um, chronic um, illnesses are kind of becoming uh, mm -hmm. bigger in the developing world. Do you see the Carter Center uh, stepping in to uh, tackle some of these emerging chronic diseases? Well, I would never say never, but I would say probably not, because one of our um, operating principles is that we don't duplicate the effective efforts of others. And I was uh, speaking to, I think it was the Kiwanis Club in Atlanta not long ago, and I was asked why the Carter Center doesn't work on HIV AIDS in Africa. And I said, because PEPFAR, which stands for the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Reduction, because PEPFAR does a, such a good job in that space. PEPFAR was begun by President George W. Bush in 2006, and it's made giant progress against AIDS in Africa. So um, cr chronic diseases draw a lot of attention, in part because um, there are sufferers from them in just about every country. So as I said, I wouldn't say never, but we probably will stick to uh, working in areas that no one else wants to, <laughs> wants to work at. Well, this is a great follow-up question. Um, how do you maintain the visibility of folks who, as you said, are neglected, um, the poorest of the poor. How do you keep people caring about these issues? 
Well, you know, one of the, the tricks is to work with the ministries of health in the countries where uh, these diseases are still endemic. And um, now that we have a global com campaign against some of them, it's easier to keep the ministries of health focused on people who may not even vote and who certainly can't contribute to their campaigns. But it has become easier, uh, frankly, since the involvement of the Gates Foundation. The kind of attention these diseases are getting uh, spurs um, national ministries to maintain their elimination or eradication efforts. We don't have a problem keeping uh, the people themselves focused. There's no problem at all getting or retaining community level volunteers, even though they're volunteers and they're not paid. So uh, there is a bit of a political problem keeping international and national focus on the problem, but um, also being near the end, being near the finish line is very powerful. Nobody wants to leave the team when you're about to score the winning goal. Speaking of which, New York Times article um, just this weekend um, has reported that uh, South Sudan is now reporting that they have eliminated um, the guinea worm disease. So congratulations on that success. This is such incredible news. Um, and we had our annual program, health program reviews at the Carter Center just last week. The Minister of Health from South Sudan was there. Um, and we had a, a small press conference with him. He spoke so movingly about this achievement. And what he said essentially was South Sudan, the newest country on the face of the earth, it was actually still Southern Sudan when the video you saw was made, uh, the newest country on the face of the earth, one of the poorest, and a country embroiled in a terrible civil war since uh, late 2013, that he was so proud that South Sudan, with all of its own burdens, had taken a step to help other people, yeah. to help basically the world by getting rid of guinea worm disease. So uh, he moved all of us uh, because he was able to think about doing something um, beyond, beyond their borders. Um, I would also say that that's an example of a place where the um, Ministry of Health officials have been just brilliant. I mean, the man who runs the guinea worm program, a man named McCoy Samuel Tibby, would have gotten an MBA at Harvard and would be a CEO of a big company if he lived and worked in the United States. He is a brilliant strategist and an equally brilliant implementer, and of course, that's very rare. That's great. Um, this is kind of a follow-up to that, um, thinking about political viability. Obviously, we see when you're close to the finish line, people want to join the team, but how do you... How do you make fighting for people who can't advocate for themselves, potentially, how do you make that politically possible, especially in countries that may have severe roadblocks in, in working out infrastructure? Well, you know, it varies. But um, as I said, we try to enlist the ministries of health, who are not usually the most powerful political um, entities in their governments. That's true. They're rarely as powerful as you know the police or the prime minister's office. But uh, we also try to make sure, again, we're partners, and we're helping and supporting their efforts. But we try to make sure that there are milestones to celebrate, uh, things that even the president or prime minister can get behind. And we try to make sure that the countries get all of the credit they deserve and more so that they can celebrate these milestones and keep that political momentum going. That's great. And again, this is a, a, another question from our audience. Um, balancing your relationships with communities versus government, I mean, uh, I'm assuming relationship building is the key to all of this, but can you comment on that? I could just say yes. <laughs> of course, of course, that is true. And the basis of this is, I think, another one of the, the values that um, underlies our work. And that is the belief that uh, people can improve their own lives if given a little bit of help. 
you know, we try not to work, well, we certainly don't work on people, and we don't even work for people. I, I like to say we only work with people. And we like to start by listening to the community. And so um, relationships are vitally important, and we've worked with some of these community volunteers for many, many years, and not just on guinea worm disease, but on some of the other NTDs that we fight. Um, and uh, we cultivate relationships in the ministries, too. It's not just the high-level people. It's the, it's the health professionals in the ministry who, who really work for decades on the same problem, and we cultivate relationships with them, too. In fact, most of them, most of the people involved in these campaigns find themselves in Atlanta in mid-March for the annual Carter Center Program Review. And I think giving uh, the microphone to uh, a, a worker from the Ministry of Health of, of Sudan or of Mali um, basically illustrates the fact that we respect them as partners. And of course, that keeps us all motivated. Um, we've had several questions asking about your relationships with uh, pharmaceutical companies and you know, seeing this as potential um, great private-public partnerships, but are there ethical considerations that need to be made as well? Well, um, I would say that um, for us, this has been an unmitigated benefit. Now, one of the diseases I didn't cover, and don't worry, I'm not going to tell you too much about yet another uh, terrible um, neglected tropical disease, except that I will say that there's a disease called onchocerciasis, known as river blindness, or RB, that can be treated with a drug called ivermectin. Ivermectin actually happens to be one of the two drugs that treats uh, lymphatic filariasis. Ivermectin is something you all know, because here it's marketed as heart guard, and many of you give it to your, your dogs to protect them from heartworm. The two scientists who discovered ivermectin about 30-some years ago were awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine uh, in 2015, I think it was. In the 80s, the CEO of Merck was a man named Roy Vagelos. And when it became clear that ivermectin not only had this um, uh, effect against worms in dogs, but would, in fact, reduce and eventually get rid of certain worms in people, notably Onchocerca valvulus, which is the RB worm, Roy Vagelos made a commitment that still sends chills down my spine. And what he said was, as much as it takes for as long as it takes. And that was 30 years ago. Um, and subsequent CEOs of Merck have kept that promise. And I, I, I'm not singling out only Merck, but this is a particularly good example of the generosity of the pharmaceutical companies. And I have not been involved in any of the other battles about prices of of, of drugs, uh, but I have to say that the, um, the value of these drugs that Merck alone donated is its billions, and the value in terms of humans spared from blindness and suffering is incalculable. So I guess I'm not the right person <laughs> to ask about the other issues, although of course, like everyone else who reads the papers, I recognize that there are some issues with um, the pricing of drugs, obviously to recover research costs, but with the implications of pricing um, that reflects the full uh, tally of those costs. That's great. Um, thinking about this, actually, somebody had asked uh, about LF and the medicine that they have to take. Is it a one-time dose? Um, do they have to? Oh, well, no. And here's another, another area where I think um, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Frank Richards, known to at least a couple people in the audience, um, has had a great impact. The medicine uh, for LF is in Africa. It's ivermectin, which I just talked about, plus a drug called albendazole, which is made by GlaxoSmithKline. In 
Hispaniola in this hemisphere, uh, the combination that you have to give for LF is ivermectin, no, it's albendazole and, oh boy, DEC, I think, yeah, or is it praziquantel or is it DEC? I think it might be diethylcarbamazine. Carb in any case, clearly I'm out of my depth on, uh, on the scientific names, but there are two medicines in combination that need to be given for LF, and, um, and they are different depending on, on, on where you are. Now, I lost the question. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, just, is this something that someone will have to take the rest of their life? Is it a one-time? Oh. No, that's what's great about elimination programs, which in the case of some diseases can lead to eradication. Because you can, if you can eliminate from every country, you have effectively eradicated. Now, for some diseases, there are some hurdles that would need to be overcome before we could move to an eradication campaign. But in the case of LF, um, a, a, a lot of progress is being made. It depends on the... Um, it depends on the strength of the infection in a particular area. But as you saw, we've eliminated LF from two very populous states in Nigeria after some years of annual doses. And um, we think the same thing can be done in other countries. So you, you have to treat regularly, annually, uh, but depending on the seriousness, the endemicity of the disease, you will be able to stop treatment and you will have interrupted transmission, meaning that the mosquitoes can no longer pick it up from me and give it to Erica. Uh, as I Thank said, for in the case of LF, sadly that does not mean that you can reverse the swelling. Or in the case of RB, if the disease has progressed, you cannot reverse the blindness um, that can ensue from that disease either. But you can make sure that no one else ever gets it after a certain number of years. So thinking about, you know, you're so close to eradicating guinea worm disease. Uh, what, what is the prognosis for LF in the world? How many countries are still facing this, uh, this disease? Well, um, I think about 50 countries still have LF. As you heard Dr. Richards say in the video, um, this is really a, a leading cause of disability in certain, in certain countries, and it's quite prevalent. It's even uh, still extant here in the Western Hemisphere. We also have a program to help uh, get rid of it from Hispaniola, from the countries of Haiti and, and the DR. Uh, but I... Um, I uh, I was very encouraged by what I heard at the program review on LF, which also took place at the Carter Center um, uh, last week or the week before. And I, I've been attending these for four years now, and there's a real sense of optimism among the scientists and physicians who deal with this. So there's a sense that L, the transmission of LF can be interrupted everywhere although um, there's still a lot of work to be done to get there. But that's the great thing about these elimination and eradication programs is that, sure, you scale up when you get to a country. You scale up so that you're treating everybody all over the country who needs treatment, but then you get to scale down. And at some point, as in Plateau and Nasarawa states in Nigeria, you're not spending any money on LF anymore. And that money is going to be available to attack some other health problem. Great. Um, I want to focus a little bit on um, the third uh, program that you meant to mentioned, mental health. Um, what, what sort of best practices have you learned from what is a pilot program in Liberia? Are there, um, are there plans to expand? <coughs> Um, there are plans to sustain, and that means in many, in this case in Liberia, that we hope the Liberian government will take this on, ideally as a line item in their budget. And, and by this, I mean training additional mental health clinicians, the refresher training for the people who are already uh, working in the mental health field, um, replacing those people who retire or leave for some reason or other, and refreshing the curriculum that they use in the training. All of this is vital for a sustainable program, and that's what we're hoping to move to at this phase. Um, 
we, I think we'd like to train more people, uh, and, and we're going to be looking at that as well while we try to see if we can get the Liberians to, uh, to give this program some, some um, sustainability. That's great. And as a follow-up, I've, I've had a couple of questions asked where funding from the Carter Center comes from, um, which I think, you know, how do you sustain these programs? But also, uh, on the flip side, how do you um, work with communities that may have issues of corruption or, you know, where you don't know if the money that you're, uh, you know, using is going to the right people? How, how do you handle those things? Well, we're very firm. We don't, we don't give bribes of any sort. And that cost us, that position cost us about two years in a program in a country that I won't name. <clears throat> and I think the program was, I mean, the problem was resolved when the person who I'm sad to say was a her, with her handout, eventually was replaced. So we just stood firm. And of course, I recognize that because we're the Carter Center and we were founded by a former president of the United States of America, it may be easier for us to stand firm and say, sorry, you know, we don't, we don't pay bribes. Uh, but that's always been our position. And even though it sometimes costs us time, um, we're not going to change that position. Now, um, many countries uh, face a very high burden of corruption, as you know. And, you know, one has to be on the lookout for this all the time when you're working uh, in these places. So, as I said, and I think clearly the efficiency with which we and every other not-for-profit operates in certain countries is compromised by behind-the-scenes deals, some of which we may never see. But, as I said, if we see it, you know, we basically stop it. I think, too, um, you're working really at a community level, so... Um yeah, these people have so little that, um, you know, sometimes I have to admit, sometimes it embarrasses me a little that we don't pay the community volunteers. They have so little. But on the other hand, the respect that working with them as partners shows them um, also is, is valuable to them, maybe more than a small um, salary would be. I don't think we found a problem with, with corruption in the communities. I really don't. I'll have to go back and ask my colleagues who've been at the Car Carter Center far longer than I, but I have not heard even a whisper uh, that at the community level, we've been asked for um, special favors to keep the program going. Great. Um, and, and again, with the Carter Center, um, do you rely on private donations? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, we rely on a, a nice mix. I have a pie chart somewhere. Um, it may even be on our website or in our annual report. Uh, many of our programs are funded by what we call institutional donors. And those are big government agencies, like in the case of the US, uh, the US USAID, or similar organizations in countries like Norway, Canada, Germany, uh, Sweden, the European Union, Japan. Um, so, and, and they often will uh, agree to fund a particular project. So that means that they uh, will say, yes, we'll fund guinea worm eradication in South Sudan, or we'll fund peace efforts in Mali, or we'll fund an election in Liberia, mm -hmm. okay? Um, last year, about a little more than 75% um, of our programs were funded that way by uh, donations from large donors like that. And the rest were funded by generous uh, priv private donations of large and small from all over the country, sometimes even from around the world. Great. Um, this is an interesting question. Um, thinking about uh, climate change, um, do you see uh, climate change affecting some of the work that you do? Um, these are neglected tropical diseases. Is there, 
fear of spreading, fear of pandemics? I mean, what do you worry about? Well, you know, I served in Bangladesh. And Bangladesh is the first non-island country that is going to suffer from the coming in, uh, rise in, in the sea level. Um, I think most of you have heard that the sea level is expected to rise by about a meter by the end of this century, which is a long time away. And when I was in Bangladesh, people were concerned but not panicked about it. But it turns out that um, the effects of the rise in sea level are being felt much earlier than anticipated. I'll backtrack and say that in Bangladesh, a lot of the very, very poor people make their livings cultivating what are called chars, which are kind of like sandbars. Um, and they don't have very fertile soil to begin with. Now, there are places in Bangladesh that do have fertile soil, but these chars, which are near, obviously near, near, near the Bay of Bengal usually, um, are not particularly fertile, and they shift. So these people, you know, uh, will move from char to char. If a hurricane destroys one sandbar and another one emerges a mile away, they move. Um, and it turns out, as you might expect, that the, the ocean doesn't rise all at once. And in fact, you get higher and higher high tides. And just like the Bible says, when you deposit salt on the earth, nothing will grow. So it's turning out that high tides are pushing salt water further and further inland. And when the water recedes, as it does, the char is still there, but it's even less viable than it used to be. So I worry because, you know, I lived there. I saw those people. Um, and I also worry because um, these are people suffering from a problem primarily not of their own making. And I worry about instability. Um, and that affects us all, not just the Carter Center. I, I, th I think I can say this. Uh, when I was at the Naval War College, one of the scenarios that we studied, gamed, as it's called, was um, driven by the assumption that um, rising sea levels and therefore restricted land to cultivate would drive Bangladeshis to India and destabilize the uh, northeastern provinces of India. And the Navy was trying to figure out what, if anything, its role could be to help in that scenario. So that's kind of a big picture answer. Yes, we do have a great program in Bangladesh right now. It's called Women and Access to Information. And I can talk about that a little if you want. But I, I'm less worried about what's going to happen to that project and much more worried about serious regional instability um, as, as millions, tens of millions of people have to, have to flee uh, and find someplace else to try to live. And maybe you could um, talk a little bit about how the Carter Center, um, how their different arms work or don't work together, right? Um, so you do work to help promote um, democracy building in, in countries. And so do you see these two kind of goals working together or not? Um, we haven't done as much of that as I would like, and we're really looking at that right now. I think you saw on the slide that the Carter Center's motto is waging peace fighting disease, building hope. And as you heard, President Carter believes that health is a basic human right. But he set up the Carter Center primarily to resolve conflicts and support and sustain human rights. Uh, the Carter Center does, you know, we, deserve, we observe elections and we mediate in conflicts and we do some behind the scenes uh, work in several uh, conflicts. Uh, right now we're working in Syria, for instance. Um, there was one great example of, of, of kind of um, taking advantage of those two pillars of our work, and that was the Guinea Worm ceasefire of 1995. Now, in 1995, Sudan was at war. So Sudan was not yet an independent country and was uh, uh, in a state of rebellion or insurgency against the government in Khartoum. But we wanted to start a guinea worm program in Sudan, keeping in mind that that also included what is now South Sudan. 
And so President Carter worked with the president of Sudan uh, and with the armed groups, the insurgents then, and was actually able to broker a ceasefire. Now, he actually negotiated a ceasefire for three months, during which um, we were able to set up the network, the infrastructure, the village infrastructure that we needed to start uh, stamping out guinea worm in this country. Actually, the ceasefire lasted almost six months, um, and I, I think it's unique, and if it's not unique, that was certainly a record for that kind of ceasefire. So that was an example of using the peace arm of the Carter Center for health programs. Now in Mali, we're actually looking at doing something um, similar, but flipping it on its head and using the health infrastructure we have to support uh, Carter Center efforts to support the peace process in Mali. Can I talk briefly about yeah, that? Yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, Mali suffered a civil war in 2012, uh, and not the first. It's a war between the north, where the people are mainly Arabs, and the south, where the people are, are, are sub-Saharan. And um, the uh, insurgents nearly took over, but the French came in and established a kind of a status quo. And in 2015, a peace agreement was signed by uh, two coalitions of armed groups. Now, it's important to remember who didn't sign the peace agreement, and frankly, who would not have been welcome to sign the peace agreement, and that is Al-Qaeda of the Islamic Maghreb and similar uh, uh, extremist jihadi terrorist organizations. But the armed groups that were motivated largely by nationalist political goals of greater autonomy and independence for their region of Mali, they did sign in June of 2015. And um, in the intervening two plus years, very little progress has been made on implementation because the sides agreed to a set of measures. And buried in that peace agreement, might be Article 63, something like that, is a provision for something called the independent observer. This is the first time that any peace agreement anywhere has included a role for an independent observer who is supposed to check the party's performance against the uh, commitments they made when they signed the peace agreement. So I'm pleased, on one level, I'm very pleased to say that the Carter Center was invited to be the first international observer, the first time that any such thing was included in a peace process. And we've started doing this. Now, I said on one level I'm pleased because um, the peace process, it, as I said, this wasn't the first civil war. Uh, the issues are extremely complex in Mali, not least because a lot of people make a lot of money from the traditional smuggling route that goes right through Mali from West Africa up to the Mediterranean coast. And what is smuggled? Just about anything you can imagine. Drugs, arms, people. Uh, and that's just one of the reasons why making peace is complicated, because certain people benefit from the status quo. Uh, so it's very risky, both physically and in terms of, uh, of the possibility of failure. Uh, but it's also very important because uh, the people there have suffered quite a bit. And uh, if the peace agreement will take hold, they have a chance to, um, to develop and they have a chance to you know, move forward together without the threat of a fourth or fifth civil war. That's a really long intro, and I apologize, but it is, as you can imagine, a complicated situation and somewhat hard to describe in 25 words or less. So um, we have long worked in Mali on guinea worm, and guinea, uh, Mali has not seen a human case of guinea worm in the last two years. So since the worm, the gestation period of the worm is a maximum of 14 months, Mali has eliminated guinea worm among humans. The reason we're not quite celebrating the way we are uh, the victory in South Sudan is that there are still a few animals, not many actually, but a few animals, in, uh, animal infections in Mali, and we need to stamp those out before we can celebrate. But we have this network that I've described, this, year, this, this network that has been there for years, this partnership, these relationships with communities, 
And uh, we are trying to figure out whether the ability to get people in, health workers in to those areas, uh, can somehow be expanded to work on other issues beyond just health and to support in some way at the community level the uh, national peace agreement. It's a little vague because we're really feeling our way, but the answer is that we are, are working really to uh, find the areas of synergy between our two areas of expertise in peace and health. Well, I, I think we see over and over again that war creates devastation, you know, even and including uh, in the country's health of oh. their people. Uh, Yemen is a great example of that. So, um, absolutely. So I have I have time for one more question, um, and this I think it's maybe a philosophical question. But uh, someone texted in referring to the direct quote at the beginning beginning of your speech. Some lives matter less than others. And that's the root of all that's wrong with the world. That was the quote. <clears throat> what do you believe the reason is that viewpoint in our society? And how do you combat that? Well, I think it's very difficult to care as deeply about people you don't know as you do about people you do. And that's why it's an ethical issue. It's not. It's, it's, uh, it's the whole, um, I am at a college, so I can say this. It's Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative. It's the golden rule. Um, and it's, uh, it's the way we need, as, as thinking human beings, to, uh, to understand our responsibilities, even though it's hard because, um, you know, we don't, we don't know those people. Now, I think uh, in the globalized world in which we live, and thanks to the internet and CNN, the immediacy of other people's suffering has increased, which may make it easier to hold these concepts. But nobody's saying that you have to take the money you were going to spend on your sister's operation and, and send it to the developing world. It's just that we have to realize that these lives matter, that these mothers and fathers love their kids as much as we do. And when you think about that, maybe you make uh, different kinds of, uh, of choices. That's the best I can say. Um, and I think, though, that um, the people I work with on the health side of the Carter Center you know, they've really internalized this. They believe it with every fiber of their being that uh, the people you saw suffering from those swollen legs should not have to, and, uh, and that if we can do anything about it, and the truth is we can. These are not expensive campaigns compared to other kinds of expenses that are out there in the world. So um, I, I, that's how I see uh, the ethical imperative behind that quote. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Peters. Thank you so much for leading us in this very important conversation. Thank you all for being a part of Great Decisions. If you want to keep the conversation going, Kathy, there's Kathy right here, Kathy Dopp. She'll be going to Derby Station in East Grand Rapids about 7.30. There'll be a continuing conversation if you'd like to take part in more conversation about global health and what you heard tonight. This is our final Great Decisions program, but don't despair. We, I'll take a couple weeks off, and we're back at it. In a partnership with the Kent District Library, April, April uh, 10, 17, and 24, Tuesdays, will be at the Wyoming branch of the Public Library for a series on civil discourse. And uh, that sounds like a good topic for these days. Uh, www.worldmichigan.org slash civil. You can find out more about it and who we're bringing in for that. Very exciting facilitators. So thank you again for coming. Let's thank Ambassador Peters one more time. Yeah.